Welcome back to the channel, everyone. As always, thanks for watching. It is like 25 degrees in the shop, which is Texan for let's shut this sh down, which I know is a little bit drastic because I know that a lot of y'all deal with this on a daily basis, but this is too cold for us. Anyway, getting into today's lesson is all about TIG welding. What makes TIG welding so difficult to learn? Why is there such a learning curve with the process? That's what we're gonna talk about today are the essential variables that you need to consider when picking up a TIG torch and trying to understand why things are so frustrating. Let's learn it. Probably one of the first steps that makes TIG welding so intimidating to a lot of new welders or someone starting out learning the process is the fact that now we have to coordinate two hands. Most MIG, stick, and other processes, you have the one hand, you can kind of get comfortable, steady things up. Well, now you've got the one hand and then another hand to use with the filler metal. We've got to feed this wire in most of the time, so we got to have it on deck and ready to go. And then you throw in something like a remote, either on the back of the torch or a foot pedal on the floor, and now there's a third thing that you have to kind of keep in touch with to make sure everything's in harmony so that you can make the best weld possible. And it is tricky. Here are a few things that you could practice. Practice a couple things. You want to take a piece of TIG wire and practice this feeding motion with a glove on, maybe with a glove off at first, but practice feeding that wire. Take plenty of dry runs, wherever your part is. Don't have a hood down or nothing. Just get where you can see properly, get eye level with the base metal, and make sure that you can make it from one end to another, maintaining those couple variables like torch angle and arc length. But get used to trying to feed it. If you can't feed it yet, grab enough wire to start with. Don't grab a whole bunch because then it gets floppy, right? So hold that arc length, maintaining that, taking a torch off the hose, wherever you're at, whether you're sitting at home, laying on the couch, having a torch just off the hose will let you kind of play with, play with the cup, walk in the cup, or maybe you can kind of just play around holding it like almost like a pencil, just kind of maintaining that arc length or having a little piece of wire in your hand so that you can feed it. Doing these things is just gonna help you get comfortable using these variables. Now, when you in incorporate a remote into it, it's just something to get used to. Don't overthink it. The remotes are pretty simple. Once you got your fundamentals worked on, there's one variable that you really gotta pay special close attention into, and that is your arc length, the distance from your torch to your work. Too far away, that arc is gonna get too high, it's gonna wander, it's gonna make that wire ball up and drop bombs into your puddle. If your puddle is even established because it's running all over the place, you're gonna get undercut, you're gonna get an inconsistent toe edge, you're gonna have porosity, so many things wrong with too far away. Now too close, you wanna get as close as possible with this arc length, really, really close, and that's gonna give you the best results. But beware, if you get too close, you're gonna dip that tungsten, now it's contaminated, which leads us into our very next problem that makes things tough keeping a clean tungsten. Dang! Man, contaminating that tungsten is probably the most frustrating part about learning TIG welding. You can contaminate your tungsten by either dipping it into the puddle, hitting your filler metal to your tungsten, forgetting to turn your gas on, not having enough gas, not having enough post flow, tons of things that can make this tungsten kind of go nasty on you. That's one nasty. thing that you gotta realize is you can't weld with a dirty one. Now, I take that back, you actually can, but as a friend told me one time, welding with a messed up tungsten is just like driving your truck with four flat tires. You can get from point A to point B, but you're gonna mess up everything along the way. So you wanna keep that in mind. Like I said, it's a very frustrating process. So typically you get a pack of tungsten, there's 10 in there, 10 full ones. My torches, I like to run them short, so I'll take each one of these long ones, break them in half. We'll stick them in our preferred sharpening method. Doesn't matter how you sharpen it. Don't at me, don't get at me how I like to do mine. You do it the way you wanna do it and don't judge me. But this is, I like this. Give everything a nice sharpening and I'll go ahead and do that to all of these. So I got 10 pieces of tungsten, break them all in half. Now I got 20. Now I'm gonna sharpen both ends of them. Now I've got 40, right? 40 sharp tungstens to start my day, to mess up. Trust me, you're gonna much rather spend the time here grinding all these tungstens at this point than having to make a bunch of trips. It's a, kind of a pain in the butt, but it's totally worth it. One other thing that I think gets new welders every single time is they're usually starting off with stick, MIG, flux core, and then working their way into TIG, and they've got these big old Mickey Mouse mittens. And while these are good, they keep the heat off and they're great for this cold weather, I can't grab crap. I can't feel nothing. TIG welding, is a, it's got a lot to do with dexterity and you've got to have the right gloves for it. Depending on the amperage you're using, you may not need thick gloves. You might just run up to some gauntlet style, some thin 
like these Cayman 1600s, these are my preferred ones. I use these for just about everything, but that works good for even pipe welds and getting into higher amps, but even lower amps, you don't need a lot of coverage. You don't need a lot of heat shielding. So we might need something to just with like a shorter cuff, nice and tight, but I can feel everything in these gloves here. I can pick up 16th inch wire, even smaller than that. Gloves are a huge thing. And if you think that even still you need more protection, you can get heat shields, TIG fingers like this TIG finger from Outlaw Leather, and you can bolster up your thin gloves so that you can handle some heat but gloves are super important. The next rule is real simple to follow and that's your material size compared to your wire thickness. Thicker the material, the thicker the wire. The thinner the material, the thinner the wire. I see a lot of people getting into TIG welding and they're using eighth inch TIG wire welding eighth inch material. Buddy, those melt at the exact same temperature. You need something that's gonna break down your base metal without melting it all the way through, giving it something to have puddle fluidity that you can actually push something smaller as a filler metal. A rule of thumb, use a smaller filler than you are base metal. Right now, for example, I'm welding eighth inch thick plate to a quarter inch plate. I'm using 16th inch filler material. I want something smaller than that eighth of an inch. I can do multiple passes if I need to, if I really gotta fill something in. If your material is really thick, say let's call it an inch thick, shove a piece of rebar in there for all I nope. care. But use a smaller filler metal for the base metal you're using. Things just weld a lot smoother. Now there are a ton of different variations of TIG torches out there and they really depends on what application that you're using or what consumables that you get, but it's so confusing, there's so many. Now most of your inverter machines, when you buy them, they're gonna give you a little package, a little care package with a collet body with the gas lens on it, maybe a piece of tungsten or two, the collet in there and the rooster tail. This is pretty much it and I'm gonna be honest, this can get you by carbon steel, stainless steel, you can get by with like 90% with this right here but I, ne I never use it. I never use this, and let me show you what I like to use for what. Now these are my go-to torch setups. So we've already looked at the Series 17 with the collet body style. This is great, what I use this for is mostly aluminum. And I'll probably have a 200 amp torch or hose on there for depending on the inverter that I'm using. I don't have a water cooler. And this is gonna be a Series 17 FV. So it's the same, same exact torch as this one. The only difference is we put a jumbo set of consumables on there and a thicker handle. It's literally the only thing. I use this for pipe welding and pipe welding alone. This really works great with a two-piece hose and amperage setup so that it can handle a lot more heat without using a water cooler, even for 150 amps. Then this is my go-to for just carbon and stainless steel is going to be your Series 9 torch with your stubby consumables as well as a Furic cup or some sort of a jumbo style cup so you get the best gas coverage because these necks, believe it or not, you can see that the neck is a little thinner. It takes a little bit more effort to get gas through here so I like to compensate with a bigger cup for sure. Well, I hope that was helpful guys. These are all variables that you need to follow to help make your TIG wells just one other thing that you can do with these Everlast machines is they all have a power set feature where you can set your wire thickness, your material thickness, and what process that you're using. It's gonna spit out the amperage or voltage or whatever you need to make the best weld possible for that process. That's the same thing for the weld app calculator inside the weld app. Yeah, check that out. It does some really cool stuff. If you wanna learn more techniques like wiggling or walking the cup, check out this YouTube video. If you wanna see a bunch of other YouTube style videos, you can go to the weld app where they all live or just get in there, ask questions, join the community. There's so many great welders and so many good people inside there answering questions, helping each other out, and maybe we'll answer one of your questions here on the YouTube channel. So go check us out on the Weld app, guys. We'll see you on the next one.